standing as we read God's Word. Open your Bible to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah, chapter 53. I'll read beginning in verse 1. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He was, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. And we'll stop there. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee, Lord, thanking you and praising you for all the wonderfulness that you have bestowed upon us. Most of all, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee, our Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the grace of God that is in our lives. And Father, I ask that you would continue to, to bless and to help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. And Father, I pray for this church. And I pray, Father, that in everything that we say and do, that we bring honor and glory to our King of King and Lord of Lords. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to do the things that are right and pleasing in thine eyes, that we would be a light in this community. And Father, I ask that you would, you would be with me this morning as thy servants, and may you give me liberty and unction from on high to present thy word in truth and in love. And I ask, Father, that you would be with each and every one that is here, our visitors and our members, that you would open up our hearts, ears, and minds to be open and receptive to thy word. And Father, I pray for the lost souls, I pray for those that know you not as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of salvation. And Father, I want to pray for those that are not here. I want to pray, Father, for uh, Brian and Debbie, Anthony, Samantha, and, and, and Michael, and Tyler, and each of them, Father, that you would be with them in a special way, that you would uh, continue to be with Anthony and, and help him, Lord, with the diagnosis of leukemia that he has. And Father, I pray that if it be Thy will, that, that they would come to know You as Lord and Savior. And Father, I ask again that You would just help us in all that we do. I ask, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins, and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. This morning, I'm going to preach on the subject, The Silent Savior. The Silent Savior. Savior. Sometimes justice is hard to come by in this world. Courts do make mistakes and sometimes innocent people suffer for crimes they did, did not 
commit it. That is, of course, what happened to the Lord Jesus when He was crucified over 2,000 years ago. He was crucified and put to death for crimes that He did not commit. Now, understand, of course, that this was all completely under the sovereignty and the plan of Almighty God. So when I say that the Lord Jesus Christ went upon the cross of Calvary and shed His blood for our sins, that is absolutely, positively the plan and the purpose and under the sovereignty of God. But the reason that Pilate sent Him there was for sins that He had not done, for crimes that He had not committed. And that will be important as we understand and look through this message today. Again, the disclaimer is it was absolutely part of the plan of God and necessary that Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, shed His blood for the remission of sin. But consider for a moment that the Lord Jesus Christ did no wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ uttered no threats. He committed no crime. And He hurt no one. But the mob and the crowd and Pilate cried out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! The Lord Jesus Christ died between two things. The accusers trumped up charges against the Lord Jesus. And in the end, he was crucified. The Lord Jesus Christ died a criminal's death hanging between two thieves. As we read the account of the prophet Isaiah of the death of the Lord, we see under the inspiration of God that Isaiah stresses how Christ responded to these accusations, these unjust accusations. Christ did no wrong. Christ had no sin. Christ could not sin. And yet He was accused and spit upon. And the crown of thorns placed upon His head. Those things that we will talk about the Lord willing in a few moments. We read in the account of the prophet Isaiah here in chapter 53 how no one came to help. No one, even at his burial, testified to the wrong way. Again, now, humanly speaking, we know under the plan of the providence of God that Christ came to die. But, I say all that to say this. This passage of Scripture, Isaiah 53, I've often said before, is a passage of Scripture that we should at the very least read weekly, as it ought to drive us to our knees in gratitude to what the Lord Jesus Christ did for our salvation. It was no light thing when Christ died upon the cross and shed His blood for our sins. Again, sins that the Lord Himself did not commit. He died for my sins. He died for your sins if you've been saved by the grace of Almighty God. Jesus Christ died for all my sins. And Jesus Christ paid the price and suffered the punishment of all eternity for me when He died and shed His blood upon the cross of Calvary. These things ought to bring us to our knees. I titled the message, The Silent Savior. I want us to consider what Jesus didn't do and what He didn't say as He stood before His accusers. Again, oftentimes, beloved, we want to defend and do all these different things and we want to make our case and plead our case. But I want you to notice that the Lord Jesus Christ, who could rightly defend His case, and who could rightly stand for these things, and who rightly did no sin, 
how he responded under the accusations of the people. We will see, first of all, the Lord's submissive silence, and then secondly, we will look at the Lord's sentence. The Lord's submissive silence. Isaiah 53 and verse 7 it was recorded, it was prophesied of Isaiah. And here's the words that we read. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb, that is unable to speak. So he openeth not his mouth. I want to begin by saying, beloved, that sometimes you and I are known by what we don't say. In this case, Isaiah prophesied that Christ would not open his mouth even in the face of certain death. And hundreds of years later, this prophecy of the Lord came to pass. Well, certainly all the prophecies of God will come to pass. Brother Matt, was it, was it you or Brother Allen that did a study of that while I was away one of those weeks, pro fulfilled prophecies, and how God will absolutely fulfill all the prophecies? It was you. You're nodding your head. So, all right. They will come to pass. And here Isaiah, under the inspiration of God, wrote that the Lord would not open his mouth as he's brought to the Lamb to the slaughter. Let's look at those references in the New Testament, if you would. We're going to read them all, in, beginning in Matthew chapter 26. Well, all that I, I have in the message. Maybe it's not every single one of the references, but... <coughs> Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 60. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 60. Well, okay, let's go to verse 59. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. To falsely accuse. All right? But found none. Amen to that, right? Jesus Christ absolutely did not sin, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Held his peace. Matthew 27, verse 12. Matthew 27, 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Mark chapter 14, verse 61. Mark chapter 14, verse 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the blessed, or art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Luke chapter 23 and verse 9. Luke 23 and verse 9. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. 
And then finally one more, John chapter 19 and verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. When the Lord Jesus stood before Pilate and Cyphaeus, he did not defend himself, and he did not try to <coughs> explain anything away. Now, I will say, you will read the accounts where when Pilate was questioning the Lord, Pilate was confused about the Lord Jesus' true identity. The Lord Jesus would speak in only, uh, in, in those cases, in order that Pilate would understand, again, who he is, not to enter into a debate with him. Beloved, we have much to learn about our Lord, and we have much to learn on how we are to live as children of God in this life. Our first indication is to continually defend ourselves, that we, and, and, and the difference is that we've done wrong. I'm not saying maybe in every situation or whether whatever it is you might be standing up for on trial or whatever the case may be, but the ultimate answer is we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are imperfect. Jesus Christ is absolutely perfectly pure and perfect. When Peter wrote to the harassed, scattered, and persecuted Christians in the first century. He, we have this passage left for us as an example for how we are to respond when we are attacked for our faith. Turn, if you would, over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened <coughs> not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but now return unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. We should learn and follow after the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Oh, how much we can learn on how we are to deal in different situations in our lives. In 1896, probably before all of you were born. In 1896, a Kansas newspaper man named Charles Sheldon wrote a novel called In His Steps. This novel was based on an unusual premise. He wrote this novel and asked what it would be like in every situation if we asked, what would Jesus do? In this book, he describes a year in the life of an American city where everyone, everyone in the city, now again in this novel, so everyone in the city, the doctors, the lawyers, the merchants, salespeople, teachers, students, pastors, and newspaper editors, all people, made that question the basis 
for all their decisions. This novel, In His Steps, became an instant bestseller. Though it is largely forgotten today, it led directly, well, many, many years later, to the WWJD bracelets that many people even still wear today. Beloved, it is a good thing for us to follow after the Lord. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. That means, even though we will suffer sometimes, and even though we may think that we have done nothing wrong, or maybe we haven't in the situation, we need to be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The greatest honor for any child of God is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest way that we can learn how to be like the Lord Jesus is to get in the Word of God and get the Word of God in us. And when we suffer unjustly, and I, I honestly cannot say that I have ever even suffered unjustly, but if we were to suffer unjustly, we could say that we share a tiny, teeny, inty, weensy little portion of what our Lord went through. Though the Lord Jesus Christ did no wrong. There was no fault in Him, as we read in the Scriptures. People today will disappoint us. Some will turn against us. Some will falsely accuse us. How will we respond? When we are insulted, our natural inclination is to return an insult for an insult. But I see here in Isaiah, I see here in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, that the Lord Jesus shows us a better way. When the Lord stood before Pilate, and when he was faced by the mocking mob, he uttered no insult, and the Lord made no threats. When they scourged him, the Lord didn't retaliate. When the soldiers put the crown of thorns upon the head of the Lord Jesus, he didn't curse at him. When they drove the nails in his hands and in his feet, the Lord Jesus didn't threaten them. When they spat upon the Lord, He didn't spit back. When they swore at Him, the Lord Jesus didn't swear back. I think we find out a lot about what we really believe when others mistreat us. And it could come at any time, mistreatment, right? I mean, we could be going about our business. I mean, the reality is I could walk into work tomorrow and there might be an accusation against me. There could be. It could be that over the duration of the weekend that somebody drums up a false accusation against me, whatever it may be. What's going to be my first indication or my first inclination? What, what would I do? What would you do? Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that is absolutely, positively, undoubtedly has done no wrong. And Isaiah says that he opened not his mouth. I believe it is safe to say for every single one of us in here today, whether you know the Lord as your only and all-sufficient Savior or not, that there is not a person in here today that has suffered in the way that Jesus did when He died upon the cross. I understand and I know that words can hurt. I have been hurt by words myself. <clears throat> I have probably been the sender of hurtful words, not to my, not to my glory. 
But beloved, when we consider what the Lord Jesus Christ endured on the cross, it is an amazing thing. Sometimes the real test of your faith is what you don't do. Now, I'm not up here preaching that we are not to fight the good fight of faith. Right? The Word of God tells us to fight the good fight of faith. But oftentimes, we would do well to keep quiet. Who fights our battles anyway? <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ, Almighty God, fights our battles. He fights our battles. So sometimes it might do as well for our testimony to keep quiet. I read this quote as I was preparing for the message. When you are mistreated, not if, but when you are mistreated, repeat these four sentences. You ready? I put them in bold so I wouldn't miss it as part of the message. I really, I really enjoyed this. Repeat these four sentences when you're mistreated. It's not about me. It's not about now. It's all about God. It's all about eternity. It's not about me. It's not about right now. It's all about God. And it's all about eternity. In other words, beloved, when we suffer, even in suffering, it would be my earnest prayer as I, as I say this and preach this now. Even if I was suffering for the Lord, or even if I was suffering for my faith, if I was suffering for what I believe, that even in the suffering, my prayer would be that my accuser, that my torturer, would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. I know that sounds mentally hard to grasp. That is, maybe somebody is... And I don't mean to be so graphic, but maybe even ripping your fingernails or torturing you for your faith that you would be praying. It's not about me. It's not about right now. It's all about God and it's all about eternity. The, even the accuser, the persecutor, would come to know Jesus Christ. Because whatever suffering would be happening to me at the present moment, is not worthy to be compared to the eternal suffering of the lake of fire. It's not about me. It's not about now. It's all about God. It's all about eternity. Seal this truth on our minds. Let's look now at the Lord's sentence. In the second part of our message. Back in Isaiah chapter 53. So again, as, as you're turning back there, so oftentimes we're ready, you know, to attack and we're ready to do all these things, but the Lord, who would have had, well, uh, okay, I'm actually getting out of myself. I'm going to talk about it. I just, sorry. 53.8, here we go. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. No one protested the death of Christ. No one spoke out about the miscarriage of justice. No one came to his defense. Uh, again, I'm not trying to preach that this wasn't the plan. This was absolutely the plan of God. And Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for our sins. But the only one that showed even a bit of concern or remorse actually was Pilate. And three times Pilate said, I find no fault in him. But the crowd was screaming. What were they screaming? Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! The very one, the very King of kings and Lord of lords, the very one that came in humbled up upon a donkey, who worked many miracles, who performed many signs and wonders, the very Savior of the world, crucify Him. Jesus Christ died for sins He did not commit. The 
Listen, when a, when a man dies young, we, we all think of what he might have been able to accomplish, or we think about what they might have been, what, what he might have been. We think about maybe the songs that he may have been able to write, the books that he may have been able to have written, or the amazing discoveries that have been made. But beloved, you cannot say that about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus has nothing left to accomplish. He was put to death for the transgression of His own people. Only the Lord Jesus is the only one in all of history that never left behind any unfinished business. His name is Jesus Christ. He left no unfinished business and accomplished everything that He set out to do. He is the only one who could come and who came to the end of His life and said with, a, with absolute and total truth, with truthfulness, I have finished everything. I have finished everything I set out to do. In fact, it says clearly in the Word of God that just before the Lord Jesus died, He cried out, It is finished. John 19.30 Let me read that to you. I need you to see this. John chapter 19 verse 30 When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Notice and words, as we mentioned in, the, in our Sunday school class, are so important. Notice, it does not say, I am finished. For that would have implied that he died defeated. But Christ said, it is finished. The work that he was sent to do was completely finished in Jesus Christ. Meaning, I again successfully completed the work I came to do. It is actually the Savior's cry of victory. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Lord Jesus Christ paid in full the price, as I said earlier, for our sins and the work that He came to do is finished. Saving The, the work that He did in, save, in, in shedding blood for the remission of sin is finished. It is such a profound thought, so complete, that it can never be repeated even by Jesus Christ Himself. For He suffered once, as it says in Hebrews. Every time I see in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't return from the throne of glory, go back upon the cross and shed His blood over and over and time and time and time again. He suffered once for the sins of God's people. He paid my entire sin debt that day upon the cross. Oftentimes, in the workplace, we have plan A, plan B, and you better have a plan C because most of the time plan A doesn't work out and most of the time plan B doesn't work out and so hopefully you have a plan C. But let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, and declared it is finished. That's it. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Oh no, hold on, hold on, hold on. The death of the Lord Jesus, the shedding of His blood was everything that was needed. Back in Isaiah 53, I've got two or three more verses to read to you and then we'll let you go. In Isaiah chapter 53, let's go back up to verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Turn over, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Romans 5, beginning in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for an avenger for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Let's just keep going. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And the Lord Jesus Christ suffered, died upon the cross. Well, guess what? There's good news. The Lord Jesus Christ did not stay in that grave. No, sir, no way. He arose. <laughs> Jesus Christ arose. And on the third day, He arose. He lives. He conquered death, grave, and death, death, grave, and hell. And He lives. Hallelujah. Christ arose. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I serve the living, the risen, living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He lives. And if you're here today and you've been saved by the grace of Almighty God, you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Praise God! He lives. And I will close with Ephesians chapter 2. If you're here today, and you're hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ, about His blood, about the Lord. Listen, I don't have any special event that happens. I don't have drawing powers. I don't want to pretend. I don't ever even want to consider that fact because it is Jesus Christ and Him alone that saves. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the Word of God says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we read with that Romans chapter 10. You ready? Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is able. God is well able to save his children. So, beloved, I preach this message, and if you are here and you're saved, I trust that God has given us a little bit of, of insight or wisdom to His Word today, <clears throat> as we're persecuted or tried. And more than that, I pray that if you're here today and you know not the Lord Jesus Christ, God has been pleased to reveal Himself unto you cause you to repent of your sins and trust in Him. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God. If we can be a help to you in any way, we offer ourselves to you. Let's stand together. Yeah, and I, we don't have any drawn out.